am Susan Lewis from WRTI. Susan, it's great to see you. I haven't seen you in months. How's your summer going? It's a strange summer. It's a very strange summer for all of us. But I love summer and I'm excited to see you and excited to talk about your feature Flicks at Five because there's a special week coming up. Well, you know, summer is the perfect time to read. And what we've done is take great books that have been turned into great movies and we're going to play the music from that on Flicks at Five. Well, I love to read books, I love to watch movies, and I love to listen to great music. But before we get started, would you like some popcorn? Oh, I'd love some. Ooh. Thank you. Ooh, delish. You make a mean bowl of popcorn, Susan. Thank you. So we begin our week with a terrific American classic novel, To Kill a Mockingbird, which was made into a wonderful movie starring Gregory Peck with music by Elmer Bernstein. So we're in for a treat right out of the box on Monday. Oh, I love that novel. And it's, I think so many of us read it growing up, but it's great to reread it as an adult. And the music in that movie um, was so perfect at capturing the small town Alabama. I understand the composer was mentored by Aaron Copeland, and you can hear the of Aaron Copeland in that, right? The, the gentle Americana music, the solo piano, really uh, evokes that era of the South. That's really great. And what's next? On Tuesday, if you remember as a kid hearing about Peter Pan, this is Peter as an older man, starring Robin Williams and Dustin Hoffman as Hook. And it's another terrific movie with music by John Williams, who of course uh, is the master of all fantasy and adventure film music. I remember that movie because I watched it with my kids. It came out in 1991 and it's a little scary, but it's also can be appreciated on so many levels because as an adult, it's about Peter who has grown up because he came, he kept coming back to visit Wendy and Wendy kept growing up and he finally decided to grow up himself. But by the time he decided to grow up, Wendy had a granddaughter. So in the movie, Peter is an adult, a workaholic in the US, married to Wendy's granddaughter, but they go to London to visit Wendy. And when Peter, the grown up Peter, walks into the nursery with the two beds on either side, the nursery where Peter Pan used to come and visit the darling children with Nana barking, the, Nana the dog barking below, you walk in he walks in and you hear this music and suddenly it brings it back, the magic, the possibility, the fact that you could fly. And it really sweeps you into the adventure of this movie. It's a, it's a great movie and the music is so perfect. John Williams has the real touch for that sort of film. Harry Potter, uh, Indiana Jones, Superman, Star Wars. He really gets into the feel of the movie and, uh, and he really delivers it with uh, his score. Absolutely. And I understand the next film, the next day, might have some special resonance for you because you are, in addition to being a classical music host, a painter. Right. I always felt that uh, painting and music and theater and literature and poetry are just facets of the same gem. And that's why it's easy for me to slip from music into art. And the artist that we'll be featuring is Johannes Vermeer in the uh, novel by Tracy Chevalier, the 1991 book, uh, Girl with the Pearl Earring, which is based on a painting by Vermeer. And the mystery is nobody really knows who that girl is. Some art historians think it's probably one of his 11 children, his daughter. Now, Vermeer only painted 30 or 34 paintings in his whole life. Uh, it's amazing he did that many <laughs> with 11 children. But uh, in the book, this is a, uh, a maid, a greet, who was played by Scarlett Johansson. Colin Firth plays uh, Vermeer. And the music is evocative of the 17th century and the feeling that she has as uh, Vermeer's uh, maid. And I know you just saw the movie not long ago. 
I had the opportunity to see the movie and it's, it's so, evo the music is so evocative because the music is mysterious and moody and I, it drove me to the book actually, because I had never read the book and I'm reading the book right now. And there's so much interior monologue because she's a 16 year old girl coming to be a maid in this painter's, famous painter's house. He's prestige, quite themed in the community and she's nervous and she's not treated that well and she's a little scared and her job is to clean his studio. And there's all sorts of interior monologue that you can hear in the music and read in the book. It's just fascinating, the relationship between the music and her thoughts. And when she cleans his studio, I just thought you would appreciate this because, you know, she has a table where he set up, to, um, the scene he set up to paint has everything just so. And for her to clean it, she has to move things just slightly and then put them right back because it has to be exactly the way he left it the day before. So, I mean, you have that problem too, but you don't probably don't have anybody there to clean your studio. I don't have a greet, unfortunately. I have to do it myself. But artists can be very fussy. <laughs> well, the other relationship I was interested in was I read in a New York Times article that the composer, who was apparently... Um, had Alexandre Desplat, yeah. Greek mother, French father, born and raised in Paris. And he said that in a New York Times article, he says when he starts a movie, he doesn't think about melodies. He thinks about colors. And colors in music are kind of similar, I guess, to colors in painting and visual things. Well, it's true. And as I said earlier, it's just facets of the same thing. And uh, when I started learning the piano, when I turned 30, I thought I should learn how to play the piano. Uh, I quickly realized that phrasing in music is very similar to phrasing in the painting. For example, you, you think of it as an entire idea, as, as, a, as a whole piece, not individual notes, not individual colors. They all come together. And that's what I think is portrayed very well in the uh, score of this movie. In fact, uh, Desplat uh, won an Academy Award for The Queen. He, uh, he wrote music for the Grand Budapest Hotel, The Shape of Water in 2017. So that music really evokes that period. Cool. And the next film we have on Thursday. Well, the next film, uh, again, is uh, music by John Williams, who it's very hard to escape music by John Williams in the movies. But uh, it, it's uh, sort of close to me in the fact that um, uh, the Adventures of Tintin, which is a Belgian comic strip, well, comic strip, but more comic uh, books. Uh, now, uh, uh, I guess the original graphic novels. Wow. The entire series I read to my son when he was uh, small, beginning to end. I forgot how many there are, but there are quite a few. And I would do all of the character voices and all of this. And I think that's what drove him in a way into becoming an actor, <laughs> which he is now. <laughs> is Tintin the boy? Tintin is the boy. And he has a little dog, which in English is Snowy. And in uh, the Belgian comics is Milou. And there's uh, his uh, friend, Captain Haddock, who is a uh, uh, sea captain. Uh, sort of a crusty sea captain. And these, these adventures were all sort of brought together in the, uh, in the 2011 movie uh, by Steven Spielberg, The Adventures of Tintin. So you get a feel of the uh, character, you get a feel of the adventures in a uh, computer generated uh, movie scored by John Williams, who also again captures the feeling of it perfectly. Wow. That's, that's really interesting. A different type of book made into a movie with great music as well. How do we end the week? We end the week with the classic American film, The Wizard of Oz. Now, that movie with that music is the perfect end to books to a film week on Flix at Five, music by, by uh, Yip Harburg and Harold Arlen. With Classics like Over the Rainbow, Follow the Yellow Brick Road, 
all of these wonderful tunes that uh, stay with us uh, you know, throughout the years. Wow, I remember that movie. I've watched it so many times as so many of us have. We all probably have our favorite scenes or the scenes that scared us the most, but it, the music is so wonderful and Over the Rainbow has achieved a life of its own outside the movie. Oh, scores of singers have performed that in every possible way. It almost didn't make it into the film and it's a very fortunate that it did. It was, uh, I, I just heard not too long ago, Tony Bennett singing it. And there's that, that famous uh, video of the Hawaiian uh, uh, performer with the ukulele singing it, which became a classic. He did one take. So these, these tunes, this music has been uh, part of our culture since 1930s. You know, it's just a wonderful movie. Well, I love the whole series, Flicks at Five. It's great because you hear this music, and if you've, heard, if you've seen the movie, it brings it all back. And if you haven't seen the movie, it makes you want to go see the movie or read the book. So we're all set for the beginning of summer. Thanks so much, Kevin. You're welcome. I hope it makes people read the books because the books are terrific as well. That's great. Well, before we go, would you like some more popcorn? Oh, sure. Ooh, thanks. I'm ready. Have a great summer, Susan.